Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Monday, January 30th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Turnout in Tunisia's second round of parliamentary election was said to be poor. The thing is that people are angry because what they want is government to do something tangible that will just lift them out of their suffering and you know, financial penury. M23 rebels block food deliveries to Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Millions of Catholic faithful in the Democratic Republic of Congo anxiously await tomorrow's arrival of Pope Francis. With nearly 25 days before elections, Nigeria's ruling party accuses the opposition of spreading fake news. Nigeria's central bank extends deadline for currency swap. To me, it's a very good development because many people that have not yet deposited their money will be able to get it across to the bank during this week. And the WHO says over 1.6 billion people are infected with neglected tropical diseases. Those stories plus Samson O'Malley's posts are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Turnout in Tunisia's second round parliamentary elections on Sunday was poured. Official numbers say only 11.3% of Tunisians cast a ballot. President Kar Sayi had hoped to use the results to push his unpopular reforms. The French press agency reports that Tunisia's main opposition has called for a united front, including civil society groups, to push for President Kar Sayi's removal. Elysia Fokman is a freelance journalist from Tunis. She tells me that the turnout from Sunday's election indicate that about 90% of Tunisians disapprove of the president. The preliminary turnout figures that have been given by the independent elections authority is 11.3%. This is roughly 0.2% slightly higher than the first round election turnout, which was historically the lowest turnout of any parliamentary election ever. Generally, the mood is that you know, people are either disinterested, not really aware of the elections, they're just not bothering to pay attention. And some people are actually very angry. The thing is that the, the situation in terms of the economy and just the, the general management of the country and the, the financial impact on not just the very poor, who are definitely suffering terribly, but it's also hitting people in the sort of middle, upper middle class you know, structures of society. You know, people are angry because rather than, you know, basically faffing around with elections, what they want is government to do something tangible that will just lift them out of their current state of suffering and, you know, financial penury. What does this mean now for President Kai Sai? I think it's further weakening his position. I think that 11.3% of electorates Turnout is probably the best poll that we have today, the most accurate poll of people who actually support him. So if only 11.3% of the population is willing to stand up for him, then it shows just how unpopular he is. The problem is that he's not somebody who's going to take a bow. I think what we will see is that once again, he will blame outside interference and you know what he calls the enemies of Tunisia and that we'll see yet more arrests, yet more military trials of civilians and the level of state violence increasing and the chaos increasing. How this will actually impact him in terms of his position and ability to hang on, we don't really know because the big problem is there's not a fully unified opposition and there's no clear alternative to Kai's side or the kind of chaotic, very corrupt goings on of Parliament that went on before the 25th of July and 2021 when he made his power grab and sacked the government. A decade ago or so, Tunisia was once the Arab world's hope for a new democracy following the Arab Spring. What do you think has happened now? Well, what's happened is that there were a lot of mistakes made such as giving members of parliament impunity. There were a lot of very practical things in terms of the nuts and bolts operating of the democracy. They were not efficient. They weren't organised. There wasn't enough connectivity with the electorate. And there was just too much petty politicking 
Elisa, thank you so much. It's so nice to talk with you. Thank you so much, James. That was freelance journalist Elisa Falkman speaking with us from the Tunisian capital, Tunis. In Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, after several days of fighting between the armed forces and the M23 rebels, the strategic town of Kishanga in Masisi territory has passed into rebel hands. Nearly 90% of the population of the town has left. Kishanga, which has about 60,000 people, is 90 kilometers from Goma, the provincial capital of North Kivu. The city is becoming increasingly isolated and life has become difficult, even unbearable for many. Journalist Zainab Neti Zaidi has the story. Some residents of Goma, the capital of North Kivu province, fear that there will be a shortage of food in the markets after M23 fighters captured Kichanga on Thursday. Most people I meet on the streets of the city say that with the blocking of Kichanga Road, food supplies are slowing. Jean Kalemo fears he will not be able to provide for his family. He says the situation is not good, the roads are closed, and he has lost hope that things will improve. He thinks that the population will not starve because Goma could become cut off from food from the villages. This concern is shared by several society in Goma. Its president says that food shortages will soon be felt. Marion Gavo is calling on the government to take steps to open up fire roads needed to transport food crops. He says that the price of food in Goma is increasing. He says that the security situation will harm the public. That is why he is asking the provincial and national authorities to do everything, try to restore calm and assure that all the people who fled abandoning their fields and crops return to their villages. The army, which claims to have made a tactical withdrawal to Kichanga to avoid civilian casualties, is trying to reassure the public that the situation will soon be under control. Colonel Guillaume Jike Kaiko, spokesman for the Sokola Day operation fighting the M23 rebels, is urging the people not to panic. He says that the armed forces of the DRC are well and present on the ground and the population has nothing to fear. He says that the M23 wants to create panic and he is asking people not to fall into the trap of the enemy. 80% of the food consumed by the people of Goma comes from rural areas invaded by the rebels. The M23 is attempting to advance into Masisi territory, one of the most important for supplying food to the city, which could make the situation even worse. The M23 says it had to take Kichanga to protect local Tutsi from what it's called genocide, an argument rejected by authorities and by human rights activists. The fighting is taking place just days before the expected visit of Pope Francis to the DRC capital of Kinshasa. For VOA Africa, Amzanem Netizaidi in Goma. Millions of Catholic faithful in the Democratic Republic of Congo are anxiously awaiting Pope Francis' arrival this week. Major preparations have been underway in the DRC, which has the largest Roman Catholic community in Africa. Pope Francis is scheduled to visit the DRC from January 31st to February 3rd. It is the first visit by a pontiff since 1985. Sylvestra Kimbese is a project manager of partnership and peace building for Catholic Relief Services in the DRC. He describes to viewers Carol Van Dam what the Pope's visit means to ordinary Congolese citizens who have been living through decades of conflict and poverty. For Congolese people, the meaning of the trip of our Pope is first benediction, benediction from God. Second, it is a reconfort 
For them, Pop is here to reconfort people. Also, he is here to call for reconciliation and peace. And finally, he is here to pray with Congolese people. Can you go into the first aspect of that answer, benediction? What do you mean by that? Yeah, benediction, because here in DRC, many people think that we are living in a malediction <laughs> because of the abundance of our natural resources. And the Pope come to bring benediction from God by his visit. It is not always that the Pope comes here, but this is an opportunity to meet people and to provide blessing from God. A lot of people would say to that, you know, blessings are nice, benediction is nice, but that's not going to change things on the ground. What do you say to that? It will not change things materially, but it will change things in the point of view in area of spirituality and behavior. People think that Pope is a big leader, a religious leader, and he can influence their behavior. So it will bring hope in the DRC. Well, what are the expectations of the Congolese people from this trip? Do they believe that Pope Francis will be able to make a real difference in convincing, you know, some of these militia groups to lay down their weapons? Well, I think that the people hope that Pope will provide orientations, orientation that will put them in the path or in, in the way of reconciliation and peace. Paul Silvestra Kimbese, the Catholic Relief Services Project Manager for Partnership and Peace Building in the Democratic Republic of Congo. You're speaking to my colleague Carol Van Dam from Kinshasa. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Monday, January 30th. And still to come on our program, Samson O'Malley Sports. The Central Bank of Nigeria on Sunday extended the deadline for citizens to swap the country's old currency notes for new ones after a public outcry ahead of the initial January 31st deadline. Central Bank Governor Godwin Emi Philly has announced a new deadline of February 10 and says it will allow for the collection of more old notes held by the public. Timothy Obiezu has more on reaction to the announcement. Godwin and Mephili announced the 10-day extension period for citizens to deposit their old notes in commercial banks after a closed-door meeting with President Muhammadu Buhari on Sunday. He said the president also approved a 7-day grace period after the extension during which citizens must deposit their expired tenders directly to the central bank. The CBN had previously said it would not extend the deadline. In October, the central bank redesigned three of Nigeria's highest currency denominations, the 200, 500, and 1,000 Naira notes. The move was a bid to rein in on excess cash in circulation to prevent counterfeiting, fight crime, and promote more cashless payments. The central bank also placed a limit on cash withdrawals. But while some praised the move, Others, including politicians and lawmakers, criticized the measure, saying change over time for the old notes was way too short. Abuja resident Adelakun Adeyemi welcomes the deadline extension. To me, it's a very good development because many people that have not yet deposited their money will be able to get it across to the bank during this week. Every queue in every bank will reduce. It will not be as much as Friday and Saturday and Sunday in some places. As of October last year, more than 85% of Nigeria's currency, about $6 billion, was still in circulation outside the votes or simply stashed away. On Sunday, the CBN said it had recovered about 70% of the excess cash. Since December, Nigeria's secret police have been investigating Central Bank Governor Godwin Emefili for alleged financial crimes, financing terrorism, and graft. Public finance analyst Isaac Botti disagrees with the extension and says the CBN succumbed to pressure from politicians opposed to currency reforms. 
when this issue of currency redesign, issue of cash withdrawal limits came up, and a number of persons, particularly those at the corridor of powers, are not favored. They feel that this guy should be taken up, and therefore they are leveling all of these allegations. If there are clear cases of financial crimes against him, then he should be relieved of his duty. So rather than that, they should stop this media prosecution. The redesigned Naira notes became legal tender in mid-December, just two months before Nigeria's elections slated for February 25th. Experts say the measure could significantly reduce vote buying. But citizens say commercial banks did not release adequate amounts of new notes into circulation ahead of the deadline, leading to millions of people scrambling to exchange via Naira. The CBN says it and the anti-graft agency has organized mass mobilization and monitoring to ensure a smooth transition. I'm Timothy Obezu for Daybreak Africa in Abuja, Nigeria. With roughly three weeks to go before Nigeria's February 25th presidential elections, the candidate of the ruling All Progressive Congress APC party is alleging that the contender of the main opposition People's Democratic Party, the PDP, Atiku Abubakar, is spreading fake news. Bayo Onanunga is the spokesperson for the APC Presidential Campaign Council. He tells me that the PDP has been spreading disinformation in the Hausa language, which is spoken in the north. He denies his party is doing the same. The evidence is that we learned from very, very dependable sources close to their campaign that the Atiku camp has met with people they call social media influencers. People have uh, some platforms in the social media. And their agenda, even to all of them, is to start writing all manners of malicious fake news, which they started, they started in, in Hanoi. They don't just focus on our candidates, as you are well as they are also focusing on this government. All they are doing is just to say in Nigeria, the market, the ruling of progressive Congress, and uh, throw all kinds of mold at the party and its candidates. If they cannot win, free and fair via the election, they can just make sure they went through some cooker ways by throwing as much, by dismatching our candidates in any way possible. And that's what we have done. Of course, it's a very malicious lie. So we try to alert the authorities, everybody to know that something is afoot. The mission to start spreading fake news, fake information all over the place to confuse people. And they're not doing it in English, they're doing it in our language. Because they know that this election, the, the battleground, especially the northwestern states, which is predominantly also speaking areas of Nigeria. Is this an issue of the pot calling the kettle black? Because, I mean, one would assume perhaps you are also doing the same. No. You see, it's there from the beginning. They want to focus on a campaign of issues. But you see, I'm not saying to their discredit, they are sort of even somehow derailed us. Because when you keep showing false things at us, we are constrained to reply them. So they drag us down along with them. But our focus, we are very clear about our focus. We want to focus on issues. We are the people spreading fake news. We don't spread fake news. We don't throw fake things at uh, our opponents. We want to tackle our opponents on the whole time of the programs we are presented to Nigerian people. So it is the PDP. Because it is the PDP knows. That to win this election, they need to get rid of our candidate. He is the one that is going to win the election free and fair if they don't engage in all these shenanigans that they are trying to engage in. Bayo Onanuga is the spokesperson for the Presidential Campaign Council of Nigeria's ruling All Progressive Congress Party, the APC. You are speaking with me from the capital, Abuja. Ahead of the World Neglected Tropical Diseases Day, which is today Monday, the World Health Organization is calling for action to tackle these debilitating illnesses, which affect an estimated 1.6 billion people globally. Lisa Schlein reports for VOA from Geneva. A diverse group of 20 parasitic and bacterial tropical diseases is categorized as neglected. This is because they disproportionately affect people who live in poor, remote communities and are not on the list of global health priorities. 
Ibrahima Sosefal is director of WHO's Department of Neglected Tropical Diseases. He says these vector-borne diseases are transmitted by insects in areas that lack safe water, sanitation, and access to health care. He says they also are spread via contaminated food and water. Fall says they cause immense suffering because of their disfiguring and disabling impact. If you take diseases like oncocercasis, you know, so-called river blindness because it can lead to, to, to blindness, the same for trachoma. And uh, so these are so many diseases that are fatal and uh, very debilitating. Trachoma is an eye disease that can cause permanent blindness. Fall says these diseases do not attract the amount of investment needed to access health services or develop new tools for diagnostics, treatments, and vaccines. He notes some of these ailments have been around for a very long time. For instance, the biblical disease leprosy still exists in 139 countries, and dengue, which has been around for 800 years, remains prevalent in 129 nations. Despite the many challenges, progress is being made in the elimination of the NTDs. WHO reports the number of people requiring NTD interventions fell by 80 million between 2020 and 2021. It finds 47 countries have eliminated at least one NTD and more countries are in the process of achieving this 